welcome to one and all. I appreciate you coming out this sunny morning, or if you're watching this on delayed broadcast, great as well. This morning, we have uh, Professor Nina Krauss from Northwestern University speaking with us. She has a new book called Of Sound Mind, How Our Brain Constructs a Meaningful Sonic World. And she does have a PhD from Northwestern and is a professor at Northwestern. She's a scientist, inventor, amateur musician who studies the biology of auditory learning. She began her career measuring responses from single auditory neurons and was one of the first to show that the adult nervous system has the potential for reorganization following learning. These insights in basic biology galvanized her to investigate auditory learning in humans. Through a series of innovative studies involving thousands of research participants from birth to age 90, her research has found that our lives and sound for better musicians, bilingual or bilingual people, or worse, language disorders, concussions, aging, hearing loss, shape auditory processing. She continues to conduct parallel experiments in animal models to elucidate the mechanisms underlying these phenomena, never having accepted a lack of technology as a roadblock to scientific dis discovery, Professor Krauss has invented new ways to measure the biology of sound processing in humans that provide unprecedented precision and granularity in indexing brain function. With her technological innovation, she is now pushing science beyond the traditional laboratory by conducting studies in schools, community centers, and clinics. Using the principles of neuroscience to improve human communication, she advocates for best practices in education, health, and social policy. So with that, help me welcome Dr. Krauss to our morning. Oh, well, hello, good morning. Uh, can everybody hear me and can everyone see me? Yep. yep. All right. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, you know, I, I wrote this book for you. This book was written with the um, intellectually and spiritually curious audience in mind, and um, and and I hope I hope you'll find meaning in it. Um, so, my lab, which is called Brain Vaults, and I encourage you, please, to to check it out um, on on uh, our, we our website. Um, it, the website is a labor of love, um, and on it, on the home page, you'll see that you know we, we investigate all kinds of things: music and reading, listening and noise, aging, concussion, bilingualism, autism, neuroeducation. You know, somebody might ask, <laughs> just what are they doing at Brain Vaults? And what unifies everything that we do? at brain volts is sound in the brain. So, you know, I think you can see how, uh, what, what, what a, a large, what a vast um, uh, um, oh, just, just, just how, how enormous um, sound and its um, effect on our daily life is it encompasses so many different areas. So this is um, an artist. Uh, I've worked, by the way, my book has uh, 80 illustrations, and 40 of them were created by Kelly, Sh uh, Katie Shelley, who uh, made this picture. And, and this was actually what I was hoping to be the cover of the book, but MIT Press uh, wanted to go with with the clip art version that uh, has prevailed. But what, what this shows, and, and I'm just so glad that, that, that we worked on this together, uh, she and I, because I have this picture to show to you today. And I, I think it illustrates the beauty and the awe and the art in science and the, the wonder that really makes me do what I do. So a little bit about me. Um, so there's me a little while ago and uh, my mommy, la mamma. Um, I was brought up in a household where more than one language was spoken. My first language is Italian. And my mom was a pianist. So I, you know, I, I grew up in this house that uh, where sound was pretty important, both uh, 
uh, musically and uh, all of the, the different sounds of, of the various languages. And when I first went to graduate school, uh, actually to uh, college, I majored in comparative literature because you know I knew some languages and I liked to read. Um, but then I took a biology class and, um, and, and I got hooked on biology. Uh, finally, I ran into a book um, that was called The Biological Basis of Language. And I thought, oh, this is great. I can uh, try to put these things together. So I went to graduate school and I, I studied in you know, neuroscience, uh, sound and the brain. And I first you know, began studying something um, which is uh, kind of unusually called uh, two-tone suppression in the auditory nerve of the chinchilla. Now, uh, this was something that was very interesting at the time to maybe 16 people. Um, and when I was explaining to my mom how I was spending my time, you know, she, she just would say, Nina, Nina, what are you doing? And, and I realized at that moment that if I wasn't doing something that I could explain to my mom, and I could explain to anyone in this audience, I, I really didn't want to be doing that thing. So then what I did is I um, moved to, to rabbits and I was recording, uh, you know, from individual neurons in the brain. You know, as I'm talking to you now, the neurons in your brain that respond to sound are producing electricity. So when you play a sound to a rabbit, you'll see the electricity um, occur in the single cell. And then if you teach the animal that this sound has a particular meaning, the, the, the rabbit is the same rabbit, the sound is the same sound, but the neuron now responds in a different way. And, and this was really powerful to me. And, and this was something that, you know, is, is really uh, a, a conceptually something that anyone understands that our, our, once sound acquires meaning, it changes us it changes the way neurons fire. So I could just see this firsthand and that was very exciting to me. So the first part of my book is, um, it's the first third, it's about how sound works. And um, you know, sound enters our ear into our brain and uh, we have pathways that go back and forth from our ear to the brain. But importantly, um, our hearing involves how we think how we move, how our other senses get put into the mix and how and our feelings. I wanna illustrate this. Um, see if you can hear a sentence inside this garbled uh, sound. Probably not. Well, the sentence embedded in there is this. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Now I want you to hear this first sentence again pops out, right? So do you believe me now that what we know about sound, how we think, what we know about sound influences how we hear it. So the hearing brain is vast and it consists of, you know, what we call cognitive, sensory, motor, and reward networks. This is really just a fancy way of saying how we think, move, and feel. Um, but for you know reward, it's it's our social bonding, our emotion. Uh, cognitive is how we engage our attention, how we think, our memory. Sensory is all of our senses, and motor is all of the movement. Uh, you know, sound itself is the movement of air, and so um, you know, and, and to create sound, we have to move. So it's very much a part of the hearing brain. The hearing brain is vast. And so it has pathways that connect the ear to the brain and then the brain to the ear. And again, it's just said another way, it is informed by how we feel, how we think, how we move, and all of our senses. So, um, you know, how can we look at this in humans? Um, you know, one of the chapters in the book is called The Quest, uh, which is, you know, kind of a, a, a quest of mine to try to really get the kind of precision that you could get in an animal model recording from an individual cell in humans. So in humans, what we do 
is um, we just put scalp electrodes on the head. And, uh, you know, again, as I'm talking to you now, the neurons in your brain are producing electricity and we can pick up that electricity and have a, a look at it. That electricity in, in response to sound. Now, sound consists of many ingredients and, and we often aren't aware of all those ingredients because, um, you know, sound is invisible. And, um, you know, whereas a visual object has a, a, a texture, size, color, and shape, um, sound also has ingredients, but you have to think about them. Uh, you know, it has ingredients like pitch, uh, timbre, harmonics, intensity, um, FM sweeps, AM sweeps. You know, there are all kinds of ingredients in sound that the brain needs to make sense of. And I really like this metaphor. So if you take all of the sound ingredients that are present as I'm talking to you now, they need to go into your brain. And I think of um, the brain is operating like a mixing board. So there are different faders that go up and down and they tune these different sound ingredients according to what is important to us and how we have spent our lives in sound. And we can measure this um, again, just by putting a, an earbud in to the ear, de delivering a sound we can then measure the electrical response to sound. And you can see that the sound wave and the brain wave actually physically resemble each other. So this is something that we have enormous precision on. And um, we can see how good a job this little guy, this particular person does processing these different ingredients of sound. So what are the strengths? What are the bottlenecks? And we can listen to the brain's response to sound. I mean, right now, you are listening to my voice that is going through a microphone and then this electricity that the microphone picks up is delivered to a speaker. We can listen to sound. And again, uh, as you are listening to me, for example, your brain is producing electricity and we can take that electricity in the same way and play it. So we can listen to the brain as well as look at how the brain processes these different sound ingredients. A couple of examples. Here is a sound that this fellow was listening to. And here is his brain response. Importantly, each one of us hears the word, the world differently. So um, I'm going to play for you now, three healthy people, three healthy brains, listening to a clip of A Hard Day's Night. And I want you to um, realize that each brain sounds somewhat different. So here's the first brain. Here's the second brain. And the third. So I hope that you realize that um, it all sounds like a hard day's night, but each brain heard it differently. And you know we can see each one of us has our own fingerprint. If you look at um, these six different people, they all have slightly different responses to a sound. And if you, again, measure that same person the next day or a week later, you will see that the same brain response happens in the same way as we uh, have a signature. We have a neural signature. So the, the major part of my book um, is how our life in sound shapes our brain. And um, so it's called Our Sonic Selves. And you ne really need to get to this part of the book. And if some of the first part is a little detailed, just keep going and know that it's there. You can go back to it. Um, but this part is, is, I think, an easy read. And um, it talks about music and rhythm, uh, language, music and language, the bilingual brain, bird song, noise, aging, sound and health, athletes and concussion. And, um, and it really provides a perspective on our sonic past, present, and how we might think about living our lives 
in the future. So I'm going to just touch up on a couple of these topics for you now, give you a, a little taste. Um, I'll start with music because music is really the jackpot in engaging our cognitive sensory motor and reward systems, right? And so by measuring the brain's response to sound in musicians, um, we can see how good a job the brain does measuring. I mean, if we just have a syllable which occurs in all of the world's languages, something as straightforward and short as da has a consonant, a vowel, it has an onset, it has a fundamental frequency, it has harmonics, it has FM sweeps, it has a lot of ingredients of sound. And what we have learned is that across the lifespan, people who regularly make music, and I, I uh, uh, define a musician as someone who just regularly plays a musical instrument, um, and we find that the harmonics and sound, the FM sweeps and timing aspects are especially um, enhanced. And these are important, not only for making sense of music, but it, you know, the harmonics and the FM sweeps and aspects of timing, this is all what distinguishes um, one speech sound from another. So there is tremendous overlap. Uh, music and language signatures overlap because the harmonics, the timing, the FM sweeps, these are really important for distinguishing a ga from a ba. Um, emotion is affected by our musical past um, in that um, musicians are shown in red and non-musicians in white. And if you listen to a baby crying, um, the musician is, uh, has very enhanced processing of the harmonics and it is the harmonics and sound that tell you when a baby's crying, um, should you get up out of your bed if he's crying in the middle of the night? Should you get up? Does he mean it? Or would it be better for both of you if he just cried a little more and you both went back to sleep? Uh, the the non-musician um, really doesn't have much processing of that important detail that tells you about the meaning of the utterance, um, but the fundamental frequency, which is a simpler part of the sound, which is basically the pitch of the sound, um, that is even more uh, processed by the non-musician because that's, that's kind of all they have to work with. Rhythm and language are very, very tied. You know, you think of rhythm as being part of music, but it's very much a part of language. And it's illustrated, I think, beautifully by this little clip you're a cheat and a swindler. That's what you are. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then smash all his dreams to pieces. You're an inhuman monster. I said good day. All right. So, you know, in, in my lab at Brain Bolts, we um, measured the uh, various rhythmic abilities in children. And in the same child, we measured how their brain responds to sound. And what we found is was the kids who were able to synchronize well to beats and could perform uh, good rhythmic tasks um, uh, had, had brain responses that were in fact um, very well synchronized, whereas the non-synchronizers did not. And what was important is that the synchronizers had better language skills. Um, and, and there are different rhythm intelligences um, there is what you might call the beat or the pulse. So who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? And then there is the pattern, which is who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? And, you know, in, in music, the beat is notated by the time signature and the pattern is, you know, we know what the pattern is based on the notes, values and rests. Um, so, you know, you can imagine how making music can strengthen rhythm skills, rhythm skills for music and for language. Um, we can also strengthen these with some um, interactive rhythm technologies. We've looked particularly at one called interactive metronome. Um, and, you know, we find that rhythm has time scales. Um, very fast rhythms at microsecond time scales and slower rhythms at seconds and minutes. And, you know, we look at beat keeping and pattern production. Um, and we see that a 
this what we might call a, a digital music medicine um, can strengthen both of these um, uh, abilities and also um, the brain's response to uh, the beat keeping and the pattern production skills. So there, there are various ways of, of doing this for a short-term therapy, but also um, I think much more pervasively actually making music. There's nothing like actually making music. And so, you know, we are interested in what we call um, neuroeducation. So uh, we wanted to know what is the impact of, of music education delivered in a real life setting that a successful setting where um, music has been taught for years and, you know, any teacher, in fact, these projects began because the teachers came to me and they said, Nina, we know that the kids who play music are the better students. What's going on in their brains? So uh, we began a series of, of studies, one in Los Angeles and the other in Chicago, um, and they, they all were in low income neighborhoods. And these went on for years and years. Um, we had a, a study design where we measured uh, the, the children's um, IQ and reading ability and um, their music skills before training. And then one group got music training and another group that was matched at the beginning for all everything we could think of um, got a different kind of enrichment activity. And then we looked at especially sound processing in the brain. <coughs> and um, this went on for, for years. Uh, here are some of the, the kids who were part of our study. And, you know, we know in low income areas, there is an achievement gap. So without music, we see that, um, you know, kids from year to year, their reading scores get worse. Whereas the kids who played music, they maintained their age appropriate reading scores. Uh, we also found that the ability to hear a noise um, so, you know, this is hearing your friend's voice in a noisy playground or classroom. Um, we didn't see any difference after one year of music making, but after two, there was really quite a big difference in the ability of the kids who played music to pick out sound, to pick up speech from a uh, challenging listening environment. Um, and again, we can see this. One of the reasons I love to do what I do is we can see all of this so clearly in the biology. So, um, you know, this is uh, in a musician, you can see both in favorable and unfavorable. So that you might think of this as quiet and noise. Listening conditions, the musicians are pretty much the same. Whereas the non-musicians are just fine in the favorable listening conditions and quiet, but you add some noise, you challenge them and the brain's response to sound really falls apart. Um, we also know that um, there is a, a biological um, signature of poverty that is, um, it, it tracks very closely with maternal education. This is work that's been done for years by many labs. Um, and you know, it, it seems that kids whose moms have um, more education um, their, these kids hear, um, you know, 30,000 more words in general than moms uh, who have less education. And we were interested, so in these low-income neighborhoods, um, we, we measured responses from children in the same classroom with the same teachers, and we just simply divided them based on their mom's education. And we found that the kids whose moms had more education had a a more precise processing of all the different sound ingredients. Um, and so the kids whose moms had less education had a less precise processing of these sound ingredients. But in addition, there was this neural, this background noise. They had noisy brains. And, uh, you know, the, our brains are always on, the neurons are always firing. And if they are firing in an unsynchronized manner, um, you know, there, there's noise. So um, if we now look at our, our faders on our mixing board and we look at the signature of poverty, we see that, that harmonics timing and how stable the response is, is really reduced in the kids um, whose moms had less education and 
um, you see this increased neural noise. When we wondered, well, what about music? Could making music help offset this neural signature? And in fact, it did. Uh, we found that um, the harmonics, the timing, and the stability, you know, this is the neural signature and FM sweeps, these were enhanced in the kids making music, but um, we didn't see any change in the neural noise. So the neural noise, the background, the noisy brains uh, remain the same. We also found that speaking another language, and many of our participants were dual English-Spanish bilinguals, and that also helped offset the signature of poverty in terms of sound processing in the brain in a different way from the musician. So it's, it's it, you know, I, I go into this in, in, in the book that, you know, you can enhance sound processing in different ways, depending on how you spend your life in sound. And importantly, it takes time to shape the brain. So in both of our studies in Chicago public schools and in Los Angeles, we found, you know, after a year, there really were no um, fundamental changes in how the brain processed sound. It was really only after two years of, um, you know, consistent music making, you know, the way you would consistently take um, any of your classes like English and math, um, music delivered either with, within school or after school, on uh, the instrument you play didn't matter, um, but making music really um, did shape the brain with respect to sound processing. Um, and so what happens is as, as we get older, um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you can strengthen the, what I wanted to say, the sound mind, not the sound mind drain, um, but, uh, but we really can strengthen the, the, the sound mind um, as, as we get older. And I also wanna say, that um, as I've been getting older, um, I, I just feel, you know, aging so often gets a bad rap. And I have to say, I'm just so much happier. And I feel that I understand things in a way that um, I just didn't understand them before. Um, and, and, you know, when we look at this from a scientific perspective, every time you measure something like, you know, reaction time, like how long does it take me to get the key into the lock and open up my door? Well, I'm going to be slower um, than I was 20, 30 years ago. But things that are really hard to measure, like wisdom, um, you know, they just don't get measured because you, they're, they're, and that's really, you know, we have to realize as scientists that there are limitations and yet there are things that, um, that happen as we age that are very, very positive. So you can strengthen sound processing in the brain um, either with uh, computer-based training. There are some, uh, there, there, and, and all of this has, has stories and, and, and um, information associated with it, you know, like what science has shown us. And, you know, I'm a biologist and so my, my, my job here and my job in the book is to talk about what science has taught us. Um, so uh, playing interactive sound-based games is one strategy, um, speaking another language and making music that I've already talked about. Um, and it's important as we lose our hearing when we get older um, to, to make sure that we are getting the best possible signal because when, you know, because hearing involves how we think. And if we are not hearing the world, it will impact not only your ability to hear what is going on next to you, but it will impact how you think. Again, this is something that I get into in considerable length in, in my book. Um, so with aging, you know, just typical aging, some of these um, responses to sound can, um, can become reduced in uh, what you might call typical aging. Um, but you know, I, again, if you measure someone who has made music regularly throughout their lives, I'm not, these are not professional musicians. These are, are you know, people uh, who, who just regularly play a musical instrument. Uh, you can see that their um, response to these different sound ingredients is as good as that of a younger person. Um, and it has a lifelong impact. So I, I often ask, you know, if 
Um, I'd have you raise your hands. You know, how many of you played a musical instrument at some time in your life? And a lot of people say yes. And then how many are still playing? And not everybody can, continues to play. But the important thing is that, again, you know, when we and others have looked at people who have made music at one time in their lives and, um, and have stopped, that still 40 years later has an impact on how the brain processes sound. Because once you have learned how to process sound in a, uh, a, a, a detailed and accurate and, and um, nuanced manner, you continue to do that throughout your life. Um, being bilingual has uh, enormous advantages as we age. Um, work uh, by Ellen Bialystok has, has shown that, you know, if, if you look at a typical growth uh, uh, cognition uh, scale, of a monolingual compared to a bilingual, you can see that it, on tests of various cognitive abilities, um, the, the bilingual just simply uh, does better and can stave off uh, some of the cognitive decline that sometimes comes uh, with getting older. Doesn't have to. Um, and so, you know, they, they looked at skills like working memory. Uh, inhibitory control, which is um, not paying attention to things that uh, that aren't important, uh, general intelligence, and what we call cognitive reserve. We can leave that for another time. Um, I want to uh, jump ahead to um, to athletes and uh, healthy and um, injured brains. And uh, you know, I you know, you might wonder, well, okay, so now she's just like jumped and what, 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 what? Here we were talking about sound and language and uh, I, I, aging. I thought I had a handle on things, and now we're talking about um, traumatic brain injury. Uh, well, you know, it turns out that making sense of sound is one of the hardest jobs that we ask our brain to do. So if you get hit in the head, you can disrupt this very intricate process. And um, we have a, a study, we have actually a number of studies going on. Uh, the National Institutes of Health is funding a five-year study with our Northwestern University elite athletes. All of our 500 division one athletes um, are part of, of a study where we measure their brain's response to sound at the beginning and at the end of every season and this is everyone. And then if an athlete sustains a concussion, we will measure their brain's response immediately following the concussion and then at weekly intervals for a long time. And here are some of uh, the athletes that we that participate in our, our study. And I, I think they are adorable. And they always love to get their brain responses tested because they get to just relax, which is something they rarely do. They're uh, so, very, very dedicated to their sport and to working hard on their fitness. Um, so, you know, given that we have these elite athletes, we wondered, was there something about sound processing in the brain in these athletes that distinguished them from uh, another 500 um, students at Northwestern who, you know, did all kinds of things, but they really weren't, they weren't our division one elite athletes. And so we looked at uh, various sound ingredients and I can show you that uh, you know, we found no difference in the brain's response to these different sound ingredients in the athletes and in the non-athletes at Northwestern University. But, um, you know, and again, this is why science is so fun. Uh, what we did discover uh, is that the elite athletes had exceedingly quiet brains. So the background noise that is, con that electrical noise, that static that is always in our brains was reduced in the elite athletes. So this has all kinds of consequences that we can think about. So, you know, if you take a, a typical listener, um, here is the, the, the sound wave and the, the brain's response to sound. And then here is the background noise in the brain. 
If you look at the athlete, you can see that the processing of sound hasn't changed. It's the same as what you see here, but it pops out. You can really see it better because the noise is reduced, right? Um, but if you look at a musician or a bilingual, the noise is the same, no difference in the noise, but the processing of the sound ingredients is enhanced. So to me, it's it's really fascinating, and and you know I, I really talk about this at, at at some length in in my book to to think about um, you know our lives in sound and what we do really matter because here you have these three ways of strengthening the sound mind um, the athlete the musician and the bilingual and they all have better sound processing they are all better attuned to sound, and yet they go about it in different ways. So um, a couple of, of wonderful musicians have endorsed my, my book, Mickey Hart from The Grateful Dead and um, Renee Fleming, um, who is just a, a marvelous person who not only is just one of the best singers I've ever heard, but is really a champion for, um, for science and for music medicine. Um, and I want to leave you now with um, my website. Again, this is our homepage. And um, I hope that you will visit it um, and that uh, you take the, there's a website tour that takes about two minutes at the top of the homepage. And if you just spend those two minutes uh, you'll be able to find what you're looking for in this website, which is otherwise um, pretty big. So um, I hope that uh, you have a lot of questions for me because I love I, I love the discussions that come out of the science that I do, and um, I hope that I hope that you'll all read the book. Maybe we can get together sometime and discuss it. That would be fun. Um, and so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pro Professor Krauss. Much appreciated. Very interesting stuff. We are going to have a, a question and answer session. We're going to take a three or four minute uh, break and interlude. We're going to play some music, hopefully enhance your mind right there before we get going on the the q &A. I wanted to mention again that we're giving several copies of Dr. Krauss's book of Sound Mind, How the Brain Constructs a Meaningful Sonic World. If you weren't here at the beginning, you can. Um, the, the book will be signed by her, and we're having to enter the raffle, fill out a brief form on today's bulletin, which you can find on, by scanning the QR code here in person or clicking on the YouTube chat or go to the ethicalhumanistsociety.org slash bulletin. You can also find a link to Dr. Krauss's website that she was referring to by going to ethicalhumanistsociety.org and follow the links to the, today's talk and to her and find out more about her as well. Um, we are now going to have a musical interlude and um, afterwards we're going to um, um, go to the Q&A. During the interlude, I please ask you to contribute to the Ethical Humanist Society. It would be fantastic if you gave us any amount of money. Five dollars would be much appreciated. More is even better, whatever you're comfortable with. Also, if you're considering joining the Ethical Humanist Society, if you're remote and watching us weeks from now on YouTube, you too can join the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. Um, we um, are an organization that really wants to support humanism, and these programs are an essential part of it. So now I know that was a false start for my AV crew. Please start the interlude, and we'll be back for Q&A in a few minutes.
Uh, thank you. Thank you for your contribution. So we're going to move on to Q&A. This can be done both here in person. We have about 10 people in the room. And if you're in the room, you should come up to the microphone. We I don't know if you can see this remotely, but we have a microphone set up. So you actually will be looking at the screen and right towards where we are seeing Dr. Krauss. You can step up to the microphone and ask a question. You can submit questions through the YouTube chat by entering it. It should be right beneath the presentation. You can type questions in and they will then get forwarded through our dynamic AV team, which I much appreciate all of their work. Steve and Ray are tireless and Kara is working behind the scenes today. All excellent, much appreciated. So please um, feel free that ding, I guess I thought I turned it off, but that's my phone saying, here's a question to pose. Um, if someone in the room wants to go first, that's fine. Otherwise I'm gonna start reading the questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks so much for a really interesting talk. I am a healthcare person and the uh, daughter of old people, one of whom is now dead. And one of the things that uh, end of life care people talk a lot about is that hearing is the last sense to leave. And hospice nurses and other end of life caregivers encourage family to speak to people as they're dying, um, even if they're not responsive on the theory that they still hear. And I'm curious if the, what their evidence is for that. Yeah, that's such a marvelous question. And it is one that is very well backed up uh, by experience and by science. So uh, not only speaking to uh, someone, uh, but also play, uh, playing sounds, the sounds that have meaning and songs um, you know, memory, in fact, memory and sound are, are, are biologically linked closer than any other sense in that, um, you know, I mean, just think from an evolutionary perspective, you know, animals had to learn if they heard a sound, is that going to be a sound um, that's going to eat them or can they eat it or is it uh, um, a, a mate? Uh, so, you know, sound is incredibly important uh, and, and engages fundamental systems in the brain, which I talk about at, at considerable length in, in my book. Um, and, and people have noticed that, in fact, that there is a, a, a local program called Songs by Heart uh, that was begun by, by Nancy Gustafson, who is a, um, an opera world renowned opera singer. And uh, she noticed that when she went to visit her mom, at an elder care facility where uh, her mom had, didn't even recognize her for now, you know, for quite a while. Uh, when she started playing on the piano, uh, her mom started singing along and then actually interacted with her and said, you know, um, that, that doesn't sound so great. <laughs> and, and then, you know, they began talking and she played some more and, and then and, and she said, oh, that's sounding really nice now. And, and so she was able to get her mom back, even for a short amount of time, through music. Um, so this is, I'm so glad that you asked that question. It's a very, very, very important one. It's a very real, and, and music and sound should become a much greater part, an integral part of medicine. Thanks. So here's a question from our YouTube channel chat. Uh, quote, noise in the brain. Uh, when you say noise in the brain, how does that manifest itself subjectively? Is that what's called monkey brain? <laughs> um, we don't really know how it manifests itself objectively. Oh, oh actually, I'm sorry. I misinterpreted your question. It does manifest itself objectively. What I, what I, can't, I can't tell you is how it manifests subjectively. Um, I mean, I, I have some ideas about how it might manifest subjectively in terms of, of, of confusion and not knowing what to pay attention to, what to ignore. But objectively, so when I measure um, the responses to sound with scalp electrodes, I also can measure the ongoing neural activity that happens when there is no sound. And so that gives me a sense of, um, you know, and, and again, you know, we, we have, have data on um, thousands of people 
where we have uh, you know a range of you know this is kind of typical neural background noise and more than this is excessive electricity think of it as static it's disorganized um and um and then you know you can see oh my, my goodness there's very little of this static in other people does that answer your question I appreciate the answer. Uh, hard to say because I got it from someone on YouTube. I'm going to read another question. Uh, what is the science of mishearing lyrics in songs, the novel way we come up with different words from what is being sung? Yeah, oh, I love that. And, and remember the, uh, what was it, the Yanni, Lori, uh, there, there was some, something that, that got a lot of attention at one point. Um, but and some of this is is due to you know when when there is an acoustically ambiguous sound, and you know in, in lyrics there, there's a lot going on in the soundscape, and you know because the sound mind interacts and intersects, engages um, how you think and feel and move, um, you you will hear some sounds, especially lyrics, and it will uh, engage uh, different. You know, you, you might think, oh, well, you know, these are these are the words that are being spoken um, or because of the way you feel, you might think, oh, this is the way the uh, the lyrics should sound. So, you know, you really go to your own personal sound mind and, and you know, and, and sometimes you just like to make up lyrics that would fit. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 the way that we engage with sound is is personal. And, um, you know, which of course it should be. I mean, you know, look at us, we all look different. Um, you know, we are individual people um, and we're going to uh, intersect with whatever it is that we hear based on, um, on, on who we are. Excellent. Steve, please, in the audience, we can step up to the microphone. Yeah, stepping back from the AV here, I'm sorry, I'm sort of a- Yeah, can, can you turn this, can you turn to your- Oh, so I can see us, okay. Since we have yeah. it set up, so we're looking at you, but you're looking up this way, right. yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, speaking from the engineering viewpoint here, I hope this isn't a too, too much of a techie engineering question, but um, I feel lucky I grew up in a musical family, um, piano and violin growing up, and my parents teaching me and things. But these are very pitched instruments with clear harmonic structures and so forth. Um, but I'm also a child of the 60s, and I listened to plenty of hard rock and things. And electric guitar came along, and you have a, a, some sounds that are based on gross distortion, amplifier overload, um, intermodulation products from everything you're playing, plus actually intermod from 120 hertz power supply hum, all sorts of crazy things that's not a clear, it's a noisy sound. So my question you're probably anticipating here is, what does this look like in the brain? And how, is that, how does your brain, does that look different than clear sounds and noisy sounds? And if that's what you're learning, how is that noise or not? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I love your question. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a um, signals man. This, I, you know, I, I spend my, 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 my life, I, I, the signals are wonderful because they, they ground me, both the sound waves and the brain waves. Now, um, there are all, so, so first of all, there, there really is something called consonance and dissonance and, um, and, and, and our brain responds to it in, in, in distinct ways, as you might expect. Um, one of the things that, you know, as, as I say, our, um, what we learn, the meanings that we ascribe to sound. And, you know, I, I'm a, I play electric guitar and I, I live with a, a guitarist and a drummer. Um, you know, I, I love distortion. And, I, and, and, and it, it is, especially as you um, move away from um, the expectations of what might be a consonant interval, for example, um, you know, your, your brain learns to be very excited by that. Um, and so it, it's really a learning process that over time, um, you know, we all of us like different kinds of music and some of it can be, um, you know, th there really is a, 
uh, an acoustic and a biological definition, as you well know, acoustically of uh, consonant and dissonant intervals. Um, and the consonant intervals are, are, are very, um, they're, they're very stark and they're very clear. Um, and the, 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 the dissonance that um, is created by, uh, by, by, by um, uh, uh, the, the, the timbre, by the harmonics and by different aspects of, I mean, you mentioned the 60 cycle hum. Um, you know, th there are so many different aspects of sound that go into the mix. And um, just because they are not crystal clear and as simple as consonants, you know, and, and kids kind of start out liking simple songs because they're kind of easy to process. But as we tune our own sound minds, we can see how rich and how beautiful, how just stunning, how glorious, what we might call distortion and noise. And again, you know, this is not the kind of noise that, um, you know, I was talking about in the brain or, you know, noise that is entirely random. This is noise, you, you might call it noise, but it is um, intense or maybe not intense sound that has a particular pattern to it. And we can, uh, you know, learn to adore those those sounds. Does that help? Well, yes, I think so. Yes, it's 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 noise, but it's not random noise, and our brains yeah. can adapt there. <laughs> Very good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. We're going to continue with questions right here in the auditorium. You mentioned athletes. You mentioned athletes with brain concussions and so on. There's a lot of people with brain injuries, car accidents, uh, veterans who've been exposed to explosive devices too close. Can any of your research be taken to help them recover or treatment? Yes, yes, absolutely. And and so, and again, I, I, I um, talk about this research in my book on uh, the, the, the chapter on um, healthy and hurting brains and you know we've known for a long time that um that soldiers who have um been involved in in well you know a lot of blasts and blast injuries um can uh, you know ha have actually a lot of the same problems that we see in um in, in our concussed athletes uh, the athlete is a really good model for understanding this because um you know these are young um, athletes who have entirely normal hearing. And when you look at, at folks who have, um, you know, been in, in the service, um, they often have some hearing loss, which complicates things, but that doesn't mean that they don't have, in addition to the hearing loss, um, the kinds of um, difficulty processing sound that we see in the athletes who have sustained a concussion. So the principle is is identical. The principle is really the same, and uh, you know from what we learn with uh, with with the athletes and what we are learning from our um, work with um, um, our, our our veterans, um, we um, I, I think are, are getting a better understanding of ways of understanding an individual person, um, where their bottlenecks are, and really appreciating that their ability to make sense of sound is something that we need to take much more seriously than we ever have. You know, concussion, you know, head injuries for the most part are, um, you know, they're, 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 they're silent uh, injuries in that we don't, you know, you, you don't see it. You know, you hardly ever see the injury show up in a brain scan because, I mean, if, if you see the injury in a brain scan, you've got a whole different kind of problem. But most concussions, you know, they, they don't show up on, the, on, on scans. And yet uh, there has been a disruption in the processing of neural activity that we can pick up. And so, again, my hope, you know, with this idea of making the work that we do um, relevant to medicine, um, my, my hope is that a measuring sound processing will become a standard of care 
um, for all kinds of head injury, both acute and chronic, and also can be a barometer for treatment. Great. So we're going to try to alternate back and forth. Let me give you a, a YouTube question, and then we'll come back to the live audience here. Uh, question is, it's become common for people to walk around wearing over-the-ear noise-canceling headphones as they go about their daily life. How might this phenomenon impact one's cognitive development? Yeah, such a good question. And so I have a chapter in my book called Noise. And, um, and, and I really talk about some of these practical solutions. And, and, and again, for each one of us, the solution is going to be different. Like I can't just give you an answer. And my students are always so furious with me because they want to know the answer. And the answer is almost always, it depends uh, because the context matters and the individual person of course will matter. So um, I personally do not use noise canceling headphones because um, you know, they work by actually producing more sound and the, the sound gets, uh, it gets canceled with the noise. Um, but you know, the cancellation is never perfect. And um, a lot of us experience fatigue after wearing these noise canceling headphones, even if you're not you know, listening to anything, you're just trying to cancel the noise. So at least for me, I prefer um, fitted or just over-the-counter over um, um, passive um, earplugs. Um, and again, there are all kinds of, of varieties that you can use at different times. Um, one of the things that, that I like to use, like, you know, when I, when I run and, um, you know, sometimes there's a lot of, of, of noise, landscaping noise and, and such. I have um, fitted um, earbuds and, um, and, I, and I have these wonderful acoustic drivers that via Bluetooth are feeding me the sound that I want to be listening to and uh, blocking out the noise. This is also what I use, you know, when, when I play drums, um, you know, I want to protect my hearing from the loud sound. So I have these, these fitted um, ear plugs and um, on top of it, you know, if I'm not playing with a band, but I'm just playing with, um, you know, whoever I've got on my phone, um, then, uh, you know, I can hear the sound of the music at the same time I'm blocking the, I'm attenuating the, um, the loudness of the drum hits right in front of my nose. Great. Um, so more questions from, right, come on up to the microphone. Another question from the auditorium. Hello. Um, so one of the key takeaways I had was that there's clear lifelong benefits to making music that we've seen in your work. Um, I'm curious, do we see any of these same benefits through other ways of interacting with music, such as singing or dancing, or is it solely dependent on like making music itself? Good, good, good question. Um, so first of all, singing counts. Um, there is not very much work on dancing uh, from a science perspective, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, you know, I'm hoping that, I know that there are people who are looking into this. Um, but one of the things that I can tell you is that what is very important in terms of fundamentally changing how your brain processes sound is to actually be making the music. So whether you're singing or playing an instrument, um, you are making these very precise sound to meaning connections. You are altering how you are playing and making the sounds based on what you are hearing and how you are moving and what you're paying attention to, what you remember, how you're thinking, how you're feeling. Um, and so just listening to music passively, you know, I like to say you're not gonna get physically fit watching sports. Sounds good. Uh, uh, I want to interject my own. I am interested in the scientific method a little bit, and I have a question about cause and effect. This is my own question, in that you seem to be studying people who play music or 
are bilingual, but it doesn't strike me as something that would lend itself to a randomized controlled trial or has it. And if it hasn't, then aren't you just finding out that people with better cognitive skills are more likely to be bilingual and play music? Yeah, that's such a really important question, the chicken and egg question. And there are various ways in which uh, scientists have approached this. Um, you, you know, first of all, the, the, the studies that I showed you, um, I, I was showing the, um, the idea of a longitudinal design. So by a longitudinal design, I mean, so you take two people and you match them before they, they learn music, you match them based on, you know, their, any, anything you can think of, um, you know, sex, age, um, musical experience, um, IQ, reading, language skills, anything that you can think of, and, and sound processing in the brain. And then you have these two groups that you follow over time, one that regularly uh, is engaged in making music and another that is regularly engaged in another kind of enrichment activity. And then when you look at sound processing in the brain, you know, really the, the strongest indication is that, um, you know, it is really only the people who are actively making music who have this um, strengthening of sound processing in the brain. And there are many other ways of, 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 of looking at this. But, you know, I also have to say that, that this idea of a randomized controlled trial, um, it works really well for drug studies. Um, you know, in, in music, a lot of times, the more levels of control that you put on a study, the less it becomes music. Um, and, and, and again, just as with, um, you know, so, so yes, there are things that we can definitely measure. I can really tell you from a biological perspective that actively making music will change, at, at least in my view, the converging evidence tells me that it changes sound processing in the brain. Um, there are other less tangible aspects, just like, um, you know, uh, I, I, when, we, when we get older, it's very, very difficult to measure wisdom. It's also very difficult to measure the self-confidence that uh, a student gains by performing on stage, by interacting um, in, in this really intimate manner with um, the other musicians that, 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 that they're working with. Um, so, you know, uh, science, science is, is, is great, um, but also something that I, I really talk about quite a bit in my book is, um, you know, that, that, that it has limitations and, and we should, we, you know, we, we should be aware of them and we should also uh, be very comfortable as, as I am saying, you know, I don't know. And to, you know, be able to say, well, you know, in, um, as a scientist, as a biologist, the converging evidence um, is giving me this point of view today. So let me give you another question from YouTube chat, and then we'll take go to someone in the audience here. Um, so from the YouTube, it says, my teen insists that he can do homework and listen to music with lyrics effectively. How can I convince him that the music is actually distracting? It may not be. And, and, and so, you know, uh, what we, we are all, we are all different and we have learned different ways of making sense of our world. Uh, for some people, especially people who, you know, might live in, in a noisy place where there are other distractions, um, you know, listening to having music on in the background, um, can be very, very helpful. And for some, you know, just, just the way that the music makes them feel, um, you know, seems to be a, a stimulant to engaging with what, uh, whatever work they're doing. You know, again, it's going to be probably, and it depends where, you know, I think telling one, one's teenager or anybody that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll think about, um, you know, how it is maybe when you're doing these, this particular job it really is helpful. You'll just do a much better job if you have um, this music with lyrics on while you're doing it. And then there may be other jobs where, um, you know, just experiment, turn it down, 
um, or you know, turn it off and see if, if you know, for some other kinds of jobs, um, it's, it, it's better without it or with the music less loud. Um, but, you know, again, th there is tremendous variability in people's um, uh, people's experience in um, dealing with, uh, with, with other sounds that they might be listening to and also what you might consider background noise. Great. Uh, we'd like to step up to the microphone. Another question from our live audience. Um, hello, uh, you've been speaking about how the um, sound brain processes or how the uh, regular brain processes sound. Um, I was wondering if you could address how people with mental health issues, um, particularly depression, which seems to be so common with COVID, perhaps bipolarism, do they process sound in the same way? And if not, is there anything that can be done to um, change this? Yeah. Well, I can tell you that there certainly has been some work on, uh, on people with the diagnosis of schizophrenia and showing that there are some uh, differences in sound processing. Um, but we really know very little about um, and, and, and I'm hoping we will learn more about how, you know, for example, depression, uh, which is, you know, this is hugely isolating um, uh, problem. And, um, you know, I mean, we, we live in a world where depression is on the rise, um, where, um, you know, we can be quite divisive um, from one group to another. And there are many um, many sources that affect our mental health, including the stress of, of noise, of, of, you know, meaningless noise in our lives. Um, but what I can tell you and what I can offer as hope and what one of the things that I find glorious about sound is that sound connects us. Sound is in the moment. Uh, you know, I mean, you've just asked me a question and I can get back and tell you what I think. And, you know, if we were uh, in a room together, you know, or if we had more time, we could go kind of back and forth. We can have what uh, Ian McGilchrist calls betweenness. Um, you know, like, I don't have a script. You don't have a script. Um, we are everyday improvisers and we are alive. We are very active. Um, and it is through sound that we connect and we can connect with each other in the world. And I maintain that uh, sound is more important than ever in, um, in connecting us. So let me grab another question from the internet and then we'll go back in person here. How might listening to an audio book differ from reading the book in terms of what's happening in the brain? Yeah, such good questions. Um, so I like to listen to audio books. And one of the things that's very important is the reader. The reader really has to, um, you know, it, it has to be a good reader. Um, but um, people have often said that they are able to remember um, and, and pay attention to an audiobook better than reading it. And I, I think that one of the reasons for this is that, you know, evolutionarily, we have been communicating through sound. And, uh, you know, I mean, even before there was writing, you know, bards would, uh, would, would, would communicate history. Um, so we've been communicating through sound for hundreds of thousands of years. It's only been 5,000 years that we've been reading. So, you know, we're really, um, you know, we, we have a brain that is extremely receptive to sound. And um, so I, I, I think that um, there are good reasons why audiobooks are um, wonderful to listen to. So another question from the live audience. Uh, so as we age, or as most people age, I think we, we suffer some hearing loss or difficulties. And uh, my concern, especially uh, personally, um, comes from background noise. And I seem to be 
less able to block out background noise as I age. And I was wondering if there's anything you could recommend to help overcome that uh, problem. Yeah, thank you. That's, you know, really one of, one of the most common complaints as we get older is, um, I mean, you know, hearing and noise is difficult for everybody and it's especially, it gets harder um, as we get older and especially if we have a little bit of a, of a hearing loss. So there are a number of things to, to recommend. First of all, make sure that, that you have, uh, that, that your, your hearing loss is corrected. Um, but that said, noise is something that as a society, we have control over much more than we think. Um, you know, we, we, there's so much racket in the world. And I, I think that what we need to do is always ask ourselves, is it necessary? There are some sounds that are, of course, necessary. You know, if you just think about going to an airport, um, you know, I mean, planes are noisy and conveyor belts make noise. But do you need to have two beeps every time a boarding pass is scanned? Beep, 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 beep. You know, I mean, everyone is sitting in the waiting area and, and you know, the, the, there's so many sounds like that, um, that, um, you know, leaf blowers uh, that, that, that we really can do without. And, um, and, and so doing what we can to, um, take control of our own sonic environment and also to um, influence the choices that we make as a society, I think are really, really important. I just wrote two um, op-eds uh, about noise. One, uh, just in, in the last month, if you uh, look, if you Google um, my name and the Wall Street Journal and noise and my name in the LA Times and noise, you'll find two short pieces um, that might be uh, helpful. And, and I also do want to mention at, at this point that if, uh, if you're interested in, in uh, purchasing my book, again, it, just uh, Googling my name and the name of the book uh, will you know, bring up many options. You can get the books from whoever your, uh, your, your favorite bookseller is. And uh, I wanted to put a plug for our local bookseller, who in fact I went over and, and signed the, the ten copies, our bookends and beginnings in, in Evanston, um, and um, so that's that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. A question from the uh, internet again: um, Have you seen research on the effect of the body chest vibrating personal e sound equipment? I'm not sure what that is. Um, and then I'm curious about the difference between sound processing of those vibrations in the deaf, for example. And I think that's a, anything you could say about, I, have you done research with deaf people as well? Yeah. Yes, Maybe. I have and other people have as well. Um, so, you know, you know, sound is vibration and, um, you know, the sound that we can feel very deeply in our uh, the vibration, literal vibration of our um, body tissues tend to be lower in frequency. You know, these are, are low pitched sounds um, and, and, you know, they are transduced in much the same way that uh, the sound that we, that is delivered through our ears is transduced. Um, also, you know, I, I think of Beethoven. Beethoven was deaf. And he created some of the most beautiful sounds we've ever heard. And um, I think that, you know, he is a testament of the sound mind, of the fact that, um, you know, making sense of sound consists of so many different um, aspects of brain processing. Um, and so, um, you know, what we are able to actually hear is, is just one part of it. Helen, you wanna step up? A little bit off topic, but could you tell us about the winged friend behind you? And maybe show Oh, him? yeah. See him? Yeah. So it's a kite. Very, very nice. 
Um, could you comment about, uh, and maybe I know that uh, Northwestern has a renowned neuroscience department. Are there people doing similar research to you, but with visual cues? Um, there's a, I see your enthusiasm for education through hearing. Um, are there people in the department and you've been able to maybe collaborate with to see, are people learning more or differently from sound versus visual cues? Yeah, um, you know, first of all, we live in a very visually biased world. And, and I think it's becoming more and more so as the world is noisier. Um, you know, you can't, you sort of forget how to listen and you can't even listen for important things. Um, there has been a National Institute for, of Health uh, for eye research, you know, 15 years before there was one for hearing. Um, and, and yes, you know, in, in the neurobiology department, you know, there have, are people who study vision and yes, um, you know, I, I uh, collaborate with visual scientists, um, but I, I, I think that um, the idea that we learn, you know, visually and through hearing and that these are um, separate is wrong-minded. Um, and in fact, I, I, um, I um, would like to, uh, to uh, recommend a book called Rethinking Thought by Laura Otis, O-T-I-S, she's at Emory. And, you know, she kind of starts out with this premise of, oh, you know, some people say that I'm a visual learner or I'm an auditory learner. And she, uh, you know, by interviewing people who are, are poets and musicians and scientists and asking them how they think and they take in the world, um, really gives us a, a very good perspective of actually what I um, am showing from a neurobiological side is the sound mind that you know, there isn't this compartmentalization of visual and auditory, but that you know, as, as, as brains and human beings, we take all of this information in together and make sense of it in our own way. Great, and one more question from the live audience. Um, I read an essay recently, and of course I don't remember where, but I wanna say New York or Atlantic or somebody, um, that I talked about quiet and he decided he needed to have absolutely no noise. And it took him like a couple of days to get to find, literally find a place with zero noise that he then sat in for like two hours or something like that. And I'm just curious, how much does it matter that we maybe never have no noise? Like, should I bother to find no noise sometimes? Yeah, it matters. And again, I'd like to recommend a book um, by Gordon Hempton. Um, it's called One Square Inch of Silence. Um, and uh, he was also one of the um, endorsers of, 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 of my book. Um, but he, he's a sound engineer and he has gone over, all over the world uh, looking for silence or places where there is no human made noise. Because you know, even if you're in a forest, it's not silent. There's a lot of, of sound going on, but it's a different quality. It's a different type of sound. Um, and um, you know, he, he found that there are only a handful of places in the whole world where you can be, um, where you can be without man-made noise for more than 15 minutes. Um, so I, I, I think that this is this is a, a reality, and it is one that um, we need to pay attention to more. And I think to the extent that you know we we have control even in our own homes and our own working places, uh, you know, to to make sure that that. Uh, you know, heating systems and refrigerators and you know all of the the sounds in 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 our lives if they can be you know you can make choices i'm i'm sure one day they will um you'll be able to buy a hair dryer um that will be pretty quiet um so these are choices that that we can make at least for ourselves and i think we should have a an open mind to whenever we can make choices 
in our world. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I personally think Evanston should have um, very strict um, landscaping noise um, um, uh, restrictions, um, you know, because, you know, these are not, um, you know, if, if you're hearing the, the, the sounds from a, a half a block away, this is not the kind of loud sound that is going to injure your ear, but it really does have a pernicious effect on uh, your, your ability to think and on your emotional health. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great Sunday.